We all have a story to tell. Let's tell yours. Welcome to the Intellectual People Podcast with your host, Jason. Come together and listen to journey stories and more from interesting people. Welcome your host, Jason. Welcome to the Intellectual People Podcast. Today, I have Christina Russell. How are you doing today, Christina? Doing great. Thanks so much. Tell me who you are. Yeah, so I'm the CEO of Radiance Holdings, and we are a platform company that um, purchases brands that are in the health, wellness, and beauty space, and we focus on franchise brands. So we've started doing this with Solo Salon Studios, which is our flagship brand. It has over, oh gosh, where are we now, 630 locations across the U.S. and Canada. And during the pandemic, we added the Woodhouse um, Spas, which is a brand that has 78 locations now. Um, across the U.S. And uh, we're looking actively all across beauty to add additional brands to our portfolio and to look for opportunities for franchisees to really get into a business that's just booming right now. What percentage are company-owned stores versus the franchise stores? Um, well, with Sola, we we actually have decided that we don't really want to go much beyond about 10% corporate ownership. We truly are a franchise brand at heart. That's certainly my background. I've been a, a veteran of franchising, and, and I call myself the journey woman of franchising. I've worked for a lot of really great brands. And uh, we believe that the right, you know, responsible thing to do as a franchisor is to own enough units that you can really understand the markets. And so we own units in California, um, in uh, Denver, which is where we're headquartered. And in Virginia, Maryland. So we've got coast to coast, a really good understanding of what's going on market wise. Um, with the uh, Woodhouse Spas, when we purchased it back in 2020, it had two corporate owned locations in San Antonio. And we've retained those as corporate locations. And we, we would consider adding a few additional extra corporate locations if the opportunity came along. Um, but at this point, we've really learned a lot from those. And our focus is really on adding franchise partners. Wonderful. Christina, let's get into your past. You mentioned that you're a former franchisee, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. I actually started my journey in franchising as a franchisee. And like so many people um, in franchising, I really had no idea what I was doing, but I had sort of this idea that I wanted to start a business. And the question was, you know, how the heck do you do that if you've never done it before? And uh, I started um, with a small fitness gym called Curves way back in the day when that brand, before it ever became anything and before it certainly grew to what it was at its peak, um, opened um, two locations in New Mexico and then later opened two more in Florida and just fell in love with the franchise model. And uh, that start as a franchisee, I think, gave me a, a really different perspective than a lot of people who come in more from the business side have. But it really showed me, you know, what is it like from the shoes of the person that is investing their life savings in something and really trying to make it great? And what should a responsible franchisor do to really support them in that journey? But uh, it was it was really where I got my start, sort of sitting in the same shoes that so many of our franchisees sit in today. Did you always want to be an entrepreneur? Oh, God, no. <laughs> it's, uh, it's funny. My husband almost dragged me kicking and screaming into it. So I, I started uh, my career in my early 20s as a science writer at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And at the time, my husband had this wild idea about becoming a franchisee. I was the head of the physics division, um, the head science writer for the physics division there and wow. just loved my career, but realized I sort of hit a career glass ceiling. And so like so many franchisees, you realize that it, as an employee of a company, you can do great things career-wise. But when you are the the you know the person sitting at the helm of the ship, you you have no limit to where you can take it. And so he had that real entrepreneurial spirit. I am a true operator. And once I got into it, what I fell in love with was the business structure and the model and how well it scales and all the things that go into running a successful franchise and then helping other people to do it. But it was I, I mean, I was the if people would have voted me in college least likely to ever major in business. So it was a little bit of a journey to get here. But uh, I ended up going back and getting my MBA. And I've been, uh, oh, gosh, at the helm now of, of what, five different companies. And so it's uh, it's been a, a fun journey, just kind of learning what it, what it takes to actually do it. And I have so much respect, I think, for the people who do have the founder's heart. But I think so many of the franchisees that I've met are people like me, where they didn't think about it until the opportunity arose. What's your undergrad degree in, actually? I was an English major. So I got my degree in English and uh, took a lot of classes in science and physics and sort of had this dual heart about the sort of uh, 
I, I guess a classic humanities kind of mindset, right? And uh, like so many people, I think I had a lot of different interests and it was a matter of finding the focus that was really meaningful. And while I was young, I mean, I, I had a long, you know, what, seven, eight year career working in, in as a science editor. And now it's been, oh gosh, 23 years working in franchising. And so you realize it sort of takes you on different journeys. But that's the cool thing about franchising, I will say though, is that it, it really doesn't matter what your background is. There's a business out there for everyone in the franchise world. And all of my experience has been in the service sector in you know fitness with curves i ultimately ended up running the uh, operations of that company when they were at about 6000 units and helped uh, to work towards selling them to a private equity firm that bought them and then after that i exited and i ran camp bow wow which was the largest dog boarding and day camp um, franchise in its time and still is it's still growing i'm really proud to have been a part of that for a few years and then ran Pure Bar to help that get to another private equity exit and then made my way to Solo, which has really been home. And then standing up this platform, you know, just the exposure to so many great brands has been incredible. What drives you to figure out your next step of what next franchise? How has that progressed from where you started? You know, it, it, that that to me, I, I, I've i learned so much from becoming a part of the International Franchising Association, and I just cannot say enough good things about that organization. But when when I think about what they do, they fight hard on the legislation, legislative and lobbying front to protect our business model. But the other thing I think they do is really focus education for franchisors on ethical franchising that puts the franchisee first. So when we look at brands for acquisition, one of the first things that we are looking at is whether or not we believe in that unit economics, whether or not we believe this is going to make the franchisees of that model successful, because that ultimately determines your success. So you can have a fantastic brand, but if the franchisee isn't realizing their dreams, their entrepreneurial dreams, you're never going to grow that brand to the degree that you want to. And it's just a recipe for conflict. So first and foremost, it's that. Do we believe in the unit economics for the franchisee? And then beyond it, do we believe it fits in our portfolio? So we're really looking at trying to, to curate a group of brands that represent the sort of premier in their vertical. So with the Woodhouse, we have nothing but pride in that brand. It really is so different than any other of the you know sort of massage concepts that are out there. Because its point of view is about creating an affordable luxury model where it's really about the experience you might have at the Four Seasons, but brought to your neighborhood. Same thing with Sola. We were the first to really build the Salon Studios concept. And where that brand really shines and has from its, its onset is that it puts the stylist first. So our core value is freedom. That is really what we, we trade on is the freedom of that stylist to experience the life of her dreams by going independent. And I think by keeping that focus, it's really kept that brand special. And so when we're looking at the brands, if the unit economics are there for the franchisee, and we believe there's a brand position that really makes it premier in its category, those are the ones we're going after. So I know there's a lot of platform companies that move very quickly and like to acquire a lot really fast. We're going to be really thoughtful on our growth and really acquire brands that we believe are going to belong in that set as far as the, the premier aspect. Christina, are you looking to expand the business in terms of your subsidiaries as well as the franchises overall? Or are you really targeting expanding franchises for your current brands? Um, both. So we look at, at growth both laterally and vertically a, as a platform company. And so the vertical growth, we've ex experienced exceptional growth in both of our brands in terms of both same store sales and in terms of scale. So Solo grows very quickly. Our, our typical year, we grow by 60 units a year, and that that is continuing on. This year, it's been a, a bit of a challenge plowing through all the, the permitting delays and the supply chain delays and all the things that go along with it. But we still have a shot at hitting our, our number of 60 this year to keep it. Our, our original number was above that, but we we know with you know the challenges we're seeing just globally right now, that's going to be a little bit harder. Um, with the Woodhouse, it'll never be a fast growth um, the way that Sola is. Sola is just gears itself well to that kind of development. The Woodhouse is very much a passion play for the franchisee. So where Sola is only sold as a multi-unit model, the Woodhouse is often a single location where the owner is just very passionate about luxury spa and wants to bring that to her community. And so we look at you know those two brands a little bit differently. But even with the Woodhouse, we have uh, focused on accelerating growth there as well, focusing first and foremost with our existing franchisees who are uh, interested in reinvesting and really building out more in their areas, and also turning on the 
engine to start recruiting new franchisees. So we turned the engine on this year. We wanted to stabilize the brand a bit first because oftentimes coming through a sale and certainly doing that during COVID can be a little disorienting for a brand. But they they both grow in terms of the number of units. They grow in terms of same stale growth. Both brands have been well above 10% same store growth. Um, Woodhouse has been tracking for this year 30% same store year over year from last year. So just incredible growth um, that we're seeing. But on the platform side, we envision a company where we continue to add brands and we think about all the modalities of beauty. We're very interested in wax. We're interested in lash. We're interested in med spa. We're interested in some of the sort of fringes of fitness, the things that would fit well in sort of the beauty and wellness category like yoga and even bar, the world that I came from, um, could be an area of interest for us. And so looking at how does it all fit together and, and what's the focus of all of those things in terms of who the consumer is. It's a very similar consumer in all of those, but also who is the beauty professional or the wellness professional that's working in those and where is their heart? Because so much of the, the work that we do as a franchisor and as our franchisees are doing is to support that, that middle customer, which is either the employee in the case of most brands or the stylist in the case of Sola. And I have a few questions uh, to ask you about all of what you just said. The first one being, what percentage of franchisees are women? So I use the word she a lot. It's my default uh, default pronoun because the world that I've lived in through my whole career has been a relatively female world. So certainly with Curves and Pure Bar, very female brands. Um, interestingly, the dog world was very driven um, by a female customer that often made that decision about where the pets would be boarded for the family. And uh, certainly in beauty, it's a very, it's still very much a female world, although we see an increasing number of men that are interested in um, facial aesthetics and things in that world, and certainly hair. A lot of our stylists are actually catering exclusively to male customers or, or uh, through barbering and things like that. Okay. And uh, so we're seeing a, a more of an influx. Um, in terms of real percentages on the solar front, um, we actually have a fair, a fair amount of, of, I'd say, balanced ownership. So very much like I saw um, with uh, Cam Bowen that we see with Woodhouse, it's couples. And on the solo front, it's typically the male that is the more involved in that because it is more of a classic development play. But the women are involved with their spouse oftentimes, and they sort of divide and conquer. And it may be that the husband is handling more of the development side of the business with construction, site selection, and the women are doing a lot in terms of the marketing, the actual operations day to day. Um, on the Woodhouse side, very similar. So we've got a lot of power couples, but it's sort of the opposite there. We see a lot of the women that are the ones that are that we're engaging with more directly. But when we do our conferences and our regional meetings, it, you see both both sides of the partnership. And so it's a lot of partnerships there. But because of the nature of our customer, I tend to use she as the dominant uh, pronoun. I understand. I just had to ask. Yeah. <laughs> How do you vet someone to make sure that your brand is the right brand for them, right? They fill out the online application because they have this dream and business ownership is one of them because obviously if you own a business, everything else is wonderful, right? And how do you make sure that not only it's a fit for them, but they're also going to be successful because their success certainly defines your success? Yeah, that that is 100 percent the truth. And I and I think that's the the danger of franchise wars that don't engage in things like IFA and really understand the sort of underside. Um, the the re reality of it is, is that the first question we really need to understand is, is what is their ability to capitalize the business? And that's often the biggest mistake that franchisors make is that they want so badly to get that person into their brand. And I get it because you've got that passion and that enthusiasm, that person that you really believe in. But if they don't have the capital to keep that business stable through rough times, it's often a recipe for disaster. And the, the model of franchising, they're taking the greater risk in that. And so it is the wrong thing to do to sell a business to somebody who perhaps doesn't have the money to do it. Now, you don't always know. You do your best to vet that. And a lot of it is self-reporting. And then we do some work on the back end to verify that self-reporting. But that's really the first question. And so our sales team knows how to understand that and how to have those conversations with the candidates to make sure that they get it, that it's, it's no harm, no foul. We would love to have you in the brand, but we don't want to see you fail. Then once they pass that threshold, it's really about brand fit. And so you, you think about this across each brand. It's a really different type of franchisee in every brand that, that I've been involved with. And just my involvement with the IFA, a lot of those of us that lead brands, we talk about that. Like, who is this, this 
you know, franchising and what's the spike that you need to see in their profile right. to really help them be successful. In our world, you you have to have someone on the Woodhouse side that's truly, genuinely passionate about spa and understands that what the brand, what the what the business really is about is supporting and retaining your spa professionals. So you think about your consumer and wanting your consumer to have a great experience, and she will. Where everyone's well trained, the menu is well established, the consumers are getting what they want. Our our NPS scores are very high, but that middle customer. The, the employee is the one that is going to make or break your business. She's the one, she, he or she is the one that's going to make you successful. And so they have to have that passion about supporting a team because a typical Woodhouse is going to have, you know, 25 employees minimum. So it's a big employment model. On the solo front, it's very similar, but it's more about having the development acumen because the model is really about building more solas. And then side by side with that, supporting those uh, hairstylists and other beauty professionals to be successful. And a lot of what the support they need from you is, is pointing them to resources because we do a tremendous amount of from the from the top down, from the franchisor down of training, of support tools, of business education, of, you know, connecting them to the big names and beauty that they need to get their back bar supplies and helping them to, to work through things like price increases and that sort of thing. So a lot of that they're pointing to the franchisor, but then day to day, it's really about maintenance. It's really about making sure that if they have a clogged sink, that you're there right away to go unclog that sink. And so it's a different franchisee that has more of a, a focus on both that service aspect, but really maintaining a facility versus managing a team of professionals that are your employees, because it's just two very, one's a B2B model and one is a B2C model. So it's just a little bit different approach. But I think it's uh, it's knowing that profile. And oftentimes what I found going into new brands you can look at the franchisees that are successful as the model and start to boil down that DNA to understand the difference between the ones that are thriving and the ones that are not. And if you understand those differences, you know who you're looking for for future growth. That's why I love growing with existing franchisees. If they've already been successful, you're super excited about seeing you in a two or three. How does the average salon owner, small salon owner, or a woman or a man that's working in a salon, save up enough to have the capital to become a business owner? Because I believe that's always one of the issues. And I know that's a very broad question and, and a very mm -hmm. simple question, right? Don't, don't live above your means and save and save and save. However, it's from a, a stepping on the outside, if you will. It's a concern because yes, from, a, from your side of the business side, having more current owners buy more franchise locations, it's best. They know what they're getting into. You know them. It's a it's a win-win for everyone, right? However, new blood being involved, I have to imagine, is also really, really important for a company. And the question is, how, have you had any employees at any of your locations actually work up to ownership? Well, you know, I, I don't know that we've had employees that have worked their way up to ownership at the Woodhouse. Um, it is a big investment there. So a typical Woodhouse, I believe in our, our current item 19, it's a $1.2 million investment, very similar to what I saw at Camp Bow Wow. So it's not trivial. So typically you're not seeing, you know, employees from of a Woodhouse work their way into that. You're seeing sort of corporate refugees, people like I was when I started my franchise, who've had a successful career have managed their own personal wealth well, are looking for that next thing to invest in. Um, on the solo side, we, we have had cases where an owner will sponsor one of their um, facilities managers to become an equity partner in it. And we've seen those equity partners then begin to you know, experience some wealth of their own and eventually go into buying a market perhaps with another, another partner. So you find that partnering sometimes does sort of happen with it. But it's uh, it's it's not in our brands typical that you're seeing a pathway from being a hairstylist to being a franchisee. We've had some of our of our solo stylists, the ones that are actually our customer, ask us about becoming franchisees. And even in that light, in, in the cases where that that's been the question, the capital is always a bit of a challenge for them because if it was a single unit, perhaps they could get there. But we only sell in three, six, and ten, and so it does tend to be someone who's found success in their career in a little bit different way. Are you open to 
other corporations buying into your business? Well, that's becoming very normal in franchising. So coming from the fitness world, you see that a lot in big brands like Planet Fitness and um, certainly Orange Theory, where you have a lot of smaller owners that get bought up by almost these mini private equity firms. Right. And I think it can be very healthy for brands. We we actually just had our first instance of that with Sola because we have a lot of very large operators and one of them brought in an outside capital partner. They didn't exit. They're still involved in the system. But we now have an outside capital partner involved that's interested in buying up more franchisees. And they've been very open about that. Um, I believe that it, it can be a very good um, uh, partnership in franchising if it's the right people and it's done well. And uh, if they have the right heart about it, they understand what the brand is. I mean, certainly you see it in Massage too. Massage Envy has gone that direction where there's a lot of, of more mass owners. The nice thing for that too is when you think about the franchisee as an investor, Every investment comes to an end, right? And so we try to educate franchisees from the very beginning to think of their investment as a 10-year timeline because that's their franchise agreement, but to also think about their exit strategy because it's it's not unusual to have a retiree that buys a franchise. So they've retired from a career and perhaps they're in their 60s. Well, it's a 10-year franchise agreement. 10 years from now, you're in your 70s and life can change very dramatically in your 70s, right? So know what your exit strategy is. When are you going to put your business to market and how do you make that you know, a high five at the back end of your franchise agreement when you do it? So I think it can be a good thing. I think we're starting to see it on the Sola side. It's less likely that we'll see something like that on the Wood side, Woodhouse side. It's not a brand that lends itself as well to that as Sola does. Is a 10-year franchise agreement kind of the industry standard? Yes. So the vast majority of brands sell with 10 with an option to renew for 10 years. Um, some of them will do 10 with an option to renew for two fives, which often aligns with leasing. But the vast majority are 10 and 10. Why, though? Why is that? Um, I, I think that there's sort of a, a perception that you want to see buy-in from the person that's coming in. I, I look at this with brands that I know of that have done five. Certainly uh, Curves was a five-year agreement. And it was a very low investment with a five-year agreement. And it's one of the many reasons why that brand had some stability issues at that first five years is that many people, hobby's done, I'm retirement age, I'm going to say goodbye, you know? And so it's sort of, it, it puts the thought in the mind of the franchisee that, that maybe that's the stepping off point. And I think when you have a franchisee who understands the 10-year investment, you want them to stay in business long enough to pay back whatever it costs to open the business and then have a long stretch of years where it's all of their money-making years, right? Because you have that initial investment that you've got to pay off. And so a 10-year agreement gives you enough time to really see some good payback at the back end of that. And then to be thoughtful about your own exit strategy at that 10-year. But in every brand I've been in, the vast majority of the franchisees um, renew again after 10 years. So they did it at Camp Bow Wow. They've, they've done it at... Uh, um, at uh, Sola. So we have a super high renewal uh, renewal rate at Sola. And we're just starting to see some of our franchisees that have been in it since the beginning, you know, 15 plus years, looking at resale and, and making that exit. And it's exciting to see that, you know, we like to see happy exits for them, but we also love renewals. It tells you a lot about the strength of a brand. Do you have to, you certainly vet the new buyer, correct? Um, yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, so in much the same way that we vet a new sale um, to grant a franchise agreement, we have the right to vet or or decline a buyer, and we keep our franchisees well educated about that. And there's a certain amount of pride that the franchisees have. So think of it almost like a. I mean, a family is probably a, a strong word for it, but it's almost like they they have these relationships with their franchisee peers. And they want to make sure that they're bringing someone in that takes their business to the next level and that makes them feel proud of what they built and what this person has walked into. So I think it makes it fairly easy because of that pride piece. I think it's a little harder when you're dealing with a triage situation and you have a brand that's struggling. But when you're selling success, you want to sell that to other people that are going to value that success the same way. But we we would. And, you know, certainly in the in the dog world, it's important that you have the right people because you're talking about the safety of animals and staff. And so I learned a lot from that brand about, you know, really thinking about the standards and how important it is to have the right folks involved. And so we turned down a lot of people that were interested just because we got it right away that they don't really have the heart to work in a world that's that complicated. In the worlds that we're in right now, it's similar. Like we know who's going to be successful and who's not. And so if the wrong candidate comes to the table, we we would pull the pull the trigger on that to be able to say, let's not set somebody up to fail. 
Are there any territories that you're targeting immediately that you look at right now that you go, this is a hot market that we really need to be in? Yeah. So with, with Solo, we're, I mean, with, oh gosh, where are we now? 630 some locations open. We look more thoughtfully about um, continuing development for existing franchisees. So some of the areas we've already got franchisees that are wanting to grow and we're selling to them to grow adjacent to their territories. And we look at where's the white space? Where do we have opportunities? So certainly, you know, we've got certain areas of focus. I wouldn't, I wouldn't venture to try to name them off the top of my head, but our development people map this very thoughtfully. We've invested in really sophisticated mapping resources, both human and technology, to be able to, to target the right markets and make sure that we're placing them appropriately. With the Woodhouse, we have so much white space. So most of the development there has been in Texas, Colorado, in the East Coast areas. And even the East Coast has plenty of opportunities. But we know that California is a great wide open market. Kudos to our franchisee out there. She she opened her doors right before we closed them all for COVID, but now has come back and is just flourishing in, in Northern California. But it's a market that we have one unit in. So we've got lots of opportunity there. So as we've turned on our franchise development engine, we're looking at, at all of the white space, again, through the, the mapping and the technology to know where that is. But there's just a lot more of it at Woodhouse. So it's a little bit broader strokes in terms of where we're putting our energy. Christina, when you say mapping, with, are you targeting, do you target like a shopping center where a grocery store is, for instance? So the way, I mean, this is, this is uh, the, the level of sophistication and that side of franchising is incredible. And when I came into Sola, it was uh, one of the things that I saw right away was we need to hire a sophisticated mapping uh, resource and we need to get the technology behind this because we're hitting that 500 mark. This was back in 2019. And that's sort of the tipping point where, you know, development gets a little bit more strategic because at first you're developing everywhere, Right. Sure. But it is uh, it is an area where the the technology you have to invest in it. It's not cheap, and the people that understand how to use it, what they're doing is mining the data, so that they can understand your specific demographics for a particular business model. But what they're mapping down to is something that they refer to as nodes of commerce. And so there's sort of a general understanding of where are those nodes of commerce and how are they evolving? As a proxy, what most of us look at in the more premier brands is where's the where's the Whole Foods? That's what you're looking for. Where's the Whole Foods? And so it's a good proxy for that, sort of like a Big Mac index is for pricing strategy. But it, it really does uh, does seem to map out that way. And then the details of it, we can map to the nuances of markets and, and rank them ABC markets and know this is like an A market and somebody is going to just go gangbusters there. They might want to open a bigger location because we know they're going to have bigger opportunities there. And another market might be a B, but if you can get the right space in that market, you can still make a killing there. And then if it's a C, if a franchisee is wanting it, we're going we're gonna to really discourage it and let them make a business case because often they fall in love with a piece of real estate but we can tell them demographically why that's a bad idea. But data tends to lag a bit. So sometimes they're right and, and the development follows in. And so you think about how I, I think of the River North area, Rhino here in Denver. It, it's, it was a bit of a nightmare, you know, five years ago, but there was a lot of money going into that area. And now it's just this thriving sort of hip, you know, millennial haven. So any of the businesses that survive that journey are, are doing really well out there now. I had an old friend that was a franchisee with a very well-known brand, and he once told me, you always go near a grocery store and you always go near a McDonald's. You That's do it. that, and you're pretty much set as long as the McDonald's is not in rural country. Yeah, and I, I would say that with McDonald's, it depends on your brand. So if you're if you're doing a if you're doing a taco brand, go where the McDonald's is. If you're doing right. a, a beauty brand. I think Whole Foods is a better proxy and you're you're really kind of looking at that as a way to say where is the where is the consumer that that drives a more expensive vehicle that shops at the expensive coffee shops that wears Lululemon and some of these premier athleisure brands that you know are are pricey that obviously it's not a price conscious sure. consumer and if you can be near those nodes of commerce you've got the right customer base that's going to pay a little more for something that's a little better and uh, if you're doing more, you know, mass market brands, you can locate them anywhere. And I think of that with Curves. I, I mean, I started my career in a mass market brand and it was amazing because it truly was the Walmart customer and you were you were looking for her and she was looking for you. And so it was this amazing pairing at the height of that brand. The consumer just had nowhere else to go. And then as things got a little more frothy and the, you know, Curves hadn't put all the operations processes in place to manage through that. 
we got our lunch handed to us a bit, but it was, uh, it was understanding that consumer that I think was so important to the growth of that brand. And I, I think in our world, it will always be a little bit more of an elevated consumer that comes to the businesses that we put into our portfolio. I did an interview um, with In Beauty, which is a beauty brand by two women that are incredible entrepreneurs. One is in the marketing and branding. The other one is more in the technical side. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about partnering with someone since you're basically in the self-care business, mm -hmm. right? Partnering with someone like that, they're sold in Sephora and online where you can offer broader services. So not only a facial, but also a complete makeover and then bring in your other partners of, like you mentioned, Pure Bar, of some sort of kind of exercise or a complete, literally a complete day at your location? Yeah. So many of our franchisees um, in local markets will partner with, for example, like cosmetics brands or makeup artists or um, yoga or bar, things like that. And they'll do sort of a, a, a more uh, holistic spa day, for lack of a better word. Sure. And that is something that they're mimicking what they see at some of the premier spas like uh, Miraval or Canyon Ranch. And if they have the square footage to do it, they'll create those kinds of experiences and it becomes sort of cross marketing with these other brands. Um, it's not something that we would necessarily lead from the top. But what we do look at when we're seeing things like that is how do we how do we tailor those trends to what we do? And so on the on the Woodhouse side, for example, it's it's looking at makeup brands and asking ourselves the question for the future. Should we have a makeup bar across all of the Woodhouse locations? And a handful of them do. And some of the consumers really like that because when you leave the spa after a facial, you don't have any makeup on, which is fine unless you're going to meet your girlfriends for lunch. And so to be able to have the touch up is becoming more of a norm in like the med spa world. And so we've thought about it, but it's not something that we've implemented system wide. Um, on the solar front, because they're all independents, it's less about that. But what we do there is we we curate educational experiences for the hairstylists. And we also have um, our third brand, which I haven't mentioned, is a brand called Beauty Hive that does back bar supplies through e-commerce for hairstylists. And that may sound like, oh, yeah, everybody's got an e-commerce. But what makes it unique, it is really the only storefront, virtual or otherwise, that sells across all the brands. So back bar supplies for hairstyles, very fragmented. So L'Oreal products only go through Salon Centric. Hinkle products go through a different vendor. And some of the niche products, you can't get it either. You have to order those through online. So we've brought them all together, all the major products that our stylists want. And we're starting to introduce product lines into that that allow them to set up almost like a mini store for makeup and things like that in their in their. Uh, their hairstyling salons. And so it's just additional revenue streams for them to test out. Yep. It's still very new. We launched Beauty Hive. It's truly a startup um, during the pandemic. And it's been exclusively for Sola stylists to this point. But there will come a point that we do open that up outside of Sola um, and uh, offer some things to the whole world of independence. So we have, what, 18,000 Sola uh, professionals now, the vast majority, 85% of which are hair. And uh, we know that we're still just a fraction of the independence market, which is probably about, oh, depends on who you ask, but it's it's north of a quarter million people and it could be as high as half a million. Wow. Yeah. I did not think it was that high. Now, the brands that are being used in your stores for from the stylist side, are you connected to any of those brands or are they using whatever brand they might want to use? So remember, core values, freedom. So they choose the products, they set their hours, they choose their services, everything is up to them. Um, but what we do is we connect them to the best educators in the industry. So with our scale and our relationships with all of the big hair brands out there, we can bring in these top educators. They're like celebrities. If you're not in the hair world, you don't know this. It was, an, it was news to me that there were celebrity hair people, but now it's like, you know, all these big names in hair. Um, but the, the hairstylists are craving that kind of education. And so we do that through our Sola Pro app, but we also do live events. We just finished a Sola Sessions event with 350 hairstylists here in Denver, where we had live stages going on, where they can see these artists creating the styles and teaching them how do you recreate that style in your salon. So it's more about education for them than it is about the experiential types of stuff because it's a B2B type of community. Very cool. Yeah. Christina, is there anything that I haven't asked you that I should have or that you would like to share? Um, I would I would say just the one thing that I try to share on these calls, just because I think people don't really understand the world of beauty and spa professionals. 
we think of a, you know, all of us as professionals, like college education is where it's at. And most of us were nerdy in some way and recruited in through college and finished our degrees and patted ourselves on the back and built careers. But there is a, there is a, a whole group of people out there that perhaps are not people that want to build their, their career and wealth through college. They're not suited to it. But they're not less than. And I think that our our world has treated them as less than. And we see beauty professionals at Sola that are making six figures doing nothing but eyebrows. So that wisdom of what does my customer want? How does she want it? How can I serve her better in a single chair salon to drive that kind of a of a of a salary is incredible. So if anything, I could say, you know, with Radiance, we're looking at ways how do we really promote beauty as a career from the onset? And provide better support for these beauty professionals that simply don't get the same mentoring and education about the things that those of us who happen to be college bound got. And so this will be a passion for us as we add additional brands, because whether you're a waxing professional or a massage professional or a hair professional, the keyword is professional. And we want them to be treated that way and to really think of this as a, as a lucrative career path and to support them through that. And I think our, our franchisees certainly have the passion around that because we know when we invest in them, they help us build better businesses. What a fantastic message. I really do appreciate that. And for everybody watching, go check out Christina Russell at Radiance Holdings. Thank you so much, Christina. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Find us on YouTube and Facebook at the Intellectual People Podcast and online at the intellectualpeoplepodcast.com. Check back for exciting new episodes.